Reactive Training Systems. Welcome back to the RTS podcast. I'm Mike Tashir, and today we're talking with John Garofano. And I just thought it would be fun to have a conversation around, I guess you could think of it as being around collaborative coaching. And in particular, the experiences that, that you and I shared as I worked up to my last competition, because that's the role that we both, well, that I took on there, right? You and I had a collaborative coaching relationship in that run up. I mean, I'm, I like to keep my hand on the wheel, but I could also recognize that my objectivity wasn't as good, you know, as we got closer and I wanted to have somebody in my corner that kind of had a little bit more distance and could provide some of the perspective that you get from a coach. We could walk down that road together. And it turned out for the best too, because there were several times that, you know, a minor injury would pop up or something wouldn't go according to plan. And, you know, the way my mind works is I start thinking about solutions immediately and it's easy to get into a knee-jerk reaction which is usually an overreaction. And it's nice to slow the pace a little bit. It's part of its perspective, but also another part of it's just slowing down, you know? So anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I don't know, what was, what was that experience like from your side being in the coach in that role? Yeah. How do you see collaborative coaching working? Well, I think I've had a good teacher, wink, wink. I think, you know, what's neat is in my own personal and athletic experience, you've been there in that seat, right? Like oftentimes I come to the table with ideas and you ask a lot of questions and you've demonstrated what that relationship can look like when you have someone who is highly engaged in the training decision process and program writing process, someone who speaks the same language. We talk a lot about that at RTS, like having this set of language that we communicate from stress index weakness analysis and correction, exercise classification, all those things. And so there's this deeper level conversation that happens when all those things are sort of taken care of. And I found that in my coaching relationships with several of my athletes who've completed the programming with the S course or are part of the training lab because we're talking the same things. So we get to like deeper levels of conversation. So all that as a pretense, I think that you've demonstrated that really well in coaching me and the conversations that we have are really deep. So when it came time to flip the script a little bit, once I got over my, oh my gosh, Mike this year is asking me a question about his training. (laughs) Once I got over that and I had a chance to sit back and think about it, it flew, it, it flowed pretty naturally to say, okay, here's the constraints that we're in, whether that be time. Cause that was one of the first things that came up for you was like bench. (laughs) You were like at this place, Hey, John, My stress is like through the roof on bench, what do? And like, it it was easy to think through the constraints there. What are some of the options that we have available to us, right? Do we increase frequency at that point? Do we increase the stress on the training days themselves? And it was pretty easy to knock off some of those things. Well, Mike can't train more time because he has a gazillion kids and responsibilities. So it's like, you start like chipping away at what are some of the options that are available to us. And then it starts to eliminate like, a good number of those to land on probably what's the best solution. And I suppose for me, what was really helpful there was to sit back and take that step back for a second and say, what would I do for any athlete? What would I want done for me? And how can I come alongside Mike to ultimately help you make the decision, right? Like just be that sounding board. A lot of times that's really what I provided to you was, Hey, all right, let's eliminate, eliminate these things. Let's talk about the pros and cons of these choices. Are there any other ones that we're not seeing? And that's one of the things that I think is really useful in having another set of eyes on your program. And it doesn't have to be someone who is a coach. It could be someone who has been in the sport for a long time or just knows you as a lifter, right? Like how many times have you trained with someone consistently? You probably go back to your academy days where you trained with people consistently. They know how you lift and they've seen you and they could just make that observation. Like, hey, Mike, I'm seeing you shift a little bit to this right leg or do this thing. And those observations are super important in making like a loading decision. The same is true like when you have a relationship with someone who has a little bit of distance, they have that relationship with you. They see the decision-making, they see some of the kind of pain points and the bottlenecks. 
and they can ask some questions to help you think through some of that. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, when we talk about coaching being leadership, relationship, creativity, and I wonder, I'm thinking out loud here, so I may be off base, but I wonder if a collaborative coaching relationship, you dial down the leadership part of it and it becomes less like what you would traditionally think of as leadership and more like guidance, mentorship almost, you know, that you're providing sounding board, providing uh, maybe experience, perspective, but ultimately it's got to be the decision is coming from somewhere else. You know, you're not the, I mean, I think classically the coach is the one to make lots of the decisions, especially decisions around a training program, you know, and there are various levels of collaboration that you may have, you know, but traditionally, you know, like we tend to have a very collaborative relationship with most of our athletes, you know, so you know, I've got an athlete that tells me, hey, I really want to do pause squats, you know, but then I look at the structure and I say, eh, pause squats don't really fit within this block. So we're not going to do that. Or, you know, recommend that we don't, and then I don't write it in the program, right? There's a lot of ways to phrase it so that it's uh, agreeable and palatable, but ultimately it's me making that decision. Whereas in this more kind of collaborative relationship, I'm not the one doing the writing you know, the collaborative coach is not the one doing the writing anyway. So you make a suggestion and it's ultimately up to somebody else, whether they're listening to that or not. Does that sound more or less correct or is my spitballing getting the best of me here? No, I think you're, I think you're spot on. I think sort of the way I thought of it is I see different styles in leadership and I think we ought to take a more chameleon sort of approach when it comes to working with athletes. Like some people personality wise, or even in their development need a more assertive leadership style. Hey, I think we ought to do this. Some people need to hear, I think we ought to do this. And here's why, because they, they want to know the ins and outs. Some people don't want to know that. They just want to know that there's a roadmap and that someone is guiding that process so that it gets it out of that person's hands. And then other people, you know, like yourself who really know quite a bit have done it for a long time and have coached themselves, they want to be the decision makers. They want to be empowered to make those decisions. But really what they're looking for is a consultant. And so the way that I approached the relationship with you was more of a consultancy. Like I thought, hey, if somebody paid for a consultation where I'm not writing the training, they just want to hear my thoughts about how things are going and what ideas I have just sitting from my seat, how would I approach that conversation? And so kind of the way that I thought of it is a collaborative leadership model of, you know, let me ask open-ended questions. Let me provide some anecdotes, some observations that I have, but ultimately Mike's going to be the decision maker. He's going to write the program. Like you're going to do the ins and outs of writing this thing and doing this complicated math that I can't even fathom and you know, to do it all this crazy stuff that only Mike T can do. But what I might provide is just that again, sounding board and asking questions to make you pause for a second. Yeah. And it's interesting, right? Because the value is just in a slightly different place, you know, that it's not so much that, well, we had lots of conversations during that run up. And sometimes I took your advice and then sometimes I didn't. And it's worth noting that even the times that I didn't, there's still value exchange there because it just the conversation itself caused me to think of it in ways that I otherwise would not have, you know, and just having gone through that thought process, I felt allowed me to make better decisions than I otherwise would have made. So that's really the point, you know, is improving the decision making more so than following the direction of one person or another. Well, to add to that too, right? So I'm picturing in my head because I'm very visual. I'm looking at a fork in the road. And, you know, there's, mo there's a couple of different paths that you could take and it's possible that all of them reach the same destination. It's possible that only two of those four reach the same destination, right? But when you take a second, you pause, you survey the landscape a little bit and you pay attention to what you're looking at. When you start heading in a direction after doing that exercise, you're more bought in on the direction that you're headed. You know, if you orient your map 
you take a second to orient your map where you're landing. I know I'm going real far with this analogy here, but you know, if you take that second and then you start heading in that direction, you're more bought in, you're more co confident and conscious of that, right? So like even the fact that you took a second pause, said, I see where John's coming from. This is an interesting idea. I wouldn't have thought of that. I think I'm going to go in this direction. The fact that you took that second, now the direction you're heading in, you're more confident in. Yeah. It's interesting too that it's easier to think about a lot of these problems conversationally than it is to just, you know, just sit by yourself, you know, which is where I've spent a good bit of my training career being self-coached. And I like that. And I tell people there's always a special place in my heart for the self-coached athlete, but it is easier to think through those issues conversationally with somebody else. Yeah. So what would you say if we were going to to reflect on that competition in particular, what would you say went well? What would you say didn't go well, if anything? What I guess maybe a, an easy lens to see that through would be, what are we going to do differently as we go toward this next competition that we're doing? So I think, you know, the first was tackling the bench stress, right? Like it was just out of control how much benching you had to do in the amount of time. And, and it wasn't working that great either. <laughs> right, right. Like it was like, okay, well, we're benching four days a week, max stress. Let's go to five days a week, max stress. And then, you know, you did the meet and you were like, it's interesting that, and you've talked about this in many different places, but like bench was the lift that had the highest specificity, the highest stress, the lift that didn't take any back seat at any point. And yet it was the one that was the least predictable for you come the day of the meet. So we had some really in-depth conversation about that. I remember at Powerlifting American Nationals, we talked about, you know, you and I, like, what are some things that could be going on biologically, like even psychologically, like what are some things that could be happening that could be things you haven't explored, even if it's, even if our thinking and our logic is false, right? What are things that you haven't explored? So to be more specific, like time away from the competition lift, you know, Mike, I remember we talked to Mark about that in a podcast about how he's noticed that as lifters age, they just need less exposure to the competition lift and they're better served having a broader like palette, a broader menu of choices and movement selections. And so that was one of the first things that we talked about. I was like, what if we do a period of time with that? And then there was like this idea of addressing some potential aerobic cardiovascular weaknesses that upper body might have for you. And what would that look like if you were trying to work on energy system development? So we were even getting to the nitty gritty of like, how do we construct a program that would measure that in some way? What, like, how, what are you looking at? You know, because we're so, it's so easy to measure one RM, you know, it's so easy to measure like effort, you know, bar velocity, RPE, all this other stuff. There's always ways to look at those things, but, and then stress index. Right. But we didn't really have a way to measure. Are you actually improving the foundation of your aerobic pathway, right? Like how do you even look at that? So we spent a good deal of time talking about that. And then that led you to create the strategy called capacitor, which you released in the training lab. And by the way, everybody loves that strategy. It's really awesome. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a lot of traction from that one, actually. It was a surprising amount. Yeah. Like who would have thought AMRAPs would catch on, you know, hashtag <laughs> CrossFit. But no, what was interesting about that was how outstanding your bench was after that right? Like following that block and then, you know, the block after that. So I think to be very specific to your question, I think leading into this comp, I think you still probably have more opportunity to explore that direction. And, you know, clearly it worked very well for you. And so I think there's probably some opportunity continuing with that strategy or iteration of that strategy in developing some of your foundation and then capitalizing on that as you get close to the meet with more of the traditional higher intensity stuff that you're used to. I think, yeah. you know, squat and deadlift perform so well on so low stress. And the temptation is to try to increase that. That's the temptation. It's our temptation, all of us, right? Oh, okay. If some is good, more must be better. Sure. And I think one of the things that you'll probably need to fight is that urge of, well, if I'm doing, you know, two, three hard sets a week of deadlift. What's five, six, you know? And I think that's probably one of the big things to look at because your deadlift performs so well. You did so little deadlifting because you had a little like injury flare up. There's like one or two situations. They weren't major, they yeah. were minor. 
but it still caused you to have some pause and loading. And right. I think that's, you know, probably one of the biggest takeaways in this upcoming cycle is to not aggressively load hinge faster than you need to. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, those are, I guess when I set that question up, I wasn't thinking of going in like the direction of specific tactics, but that's pretty cool that you have all that stuff off the top of your head. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm mostly in agreement with you and I definitely learned a lot from the capacitor experiment earlier this spring. One of the things that I learned from that is that I don't think I was including enough like loading variety, you know, that I think I was in need of a greater range of loading recommendations. Getting away from the comp lift is important for, I don't know, we don't have a term for it, like an accepted term for it, but there's like beginner, novice, intermediate, advanced, but what's the stage past advanced, you know? veteran lifters, old people lifters. I don't know what you want to call it, but <laughs> I don't know. I'm not even 40 yet. So I don't, I have a problem calling myself an old person lifter, but anyway, people who've been doing it a long time. Yeah. We find that they need less of the competition lift. In my case in particular, I don't get beat up from any of the competition lifts exactly, especially not the bench. So it's not that I need that time with something that I'm like more orthopedically suited to or anything like that. I can train that comp lift just fine. So I wonder like how much of it was getting away from the competition lift versus having enough variety in the way that it was loaded and it's splitting hairs, but it does matter a little bit. So in so far as we've started working toward this competition, I've really included a lot more loading variety, even when there is more specificity for the comp lift, just in general, you know, so the exercises that I'm picking tend to be a little bit more standard issue, but there's a lot more loading variety. And so far, I think it's been helpful. It's certain my strength is certainly okay. And I'm getting ready to go into the last two blocks where we really do lean on the things that we know to be effective. So I think it will peak nicely for this and hopefully it'll be starting from a pretty advantaged position, you know, and squat and deadlift. Well, let me stop there. We can talk about bench for a second first. Well, I wanted to just jump in and provide another anecdote. So this is the cool collaborative part, right? Like you talk about your training. I talk about mine. We talk about observations as athletes and as coaches. And that's yeah. Yeah, a lot of time. That's really all you needed was like that creative space to think through the problem a bit. When you gave me an iteration of capacitor for my own training, I noticed that my bench skyrocketed and I absolutely wouldn't classify myself as the same experience level as you, but I did notice that the variety in loading. So the very traditional powerlifting loading, like, hey, we're going to work up to a four out of nine. We're going to do a double, you know, it's like, those are very traditional. But then when you start throwing in, we're going to do a six out of nine, a 12 out of nine, we're going to do a whole bunch of work in a short time period. That was so novel. And I also wonder, is it the novelty, right? Because yeah. when you look at like periodization, that is one of the things that's talked about is like novelty in differentiating blocks is important to some degree. And I think sometimes, at least with more experienced athletes, we can get into this kind of rut of, okay, well, we've got to do three competitions this year. We're going to do tier one strategy or tier two strategy, tier one strategy, compete. We've got enough yeah. time for a very short off season, if we even do an off season, and then tier one or tier two, tier one, compete, right? And it makes me wonder, do we ought to be exploring more rep ranges, you know, like the dreaded eight? rep range, 10 rep range, you know, on squat and things of that nature. Like we don't want to do it, but maybe it is beneficial. Yeah. I think that there definitely needs to be a greater variety of loading patterns. And I think this is a trap that lots of lifters fall into. I, I, it makes for a nice story to talk about intermediate lifters falling into this trap, but it can really happen to anybody. You start doing a thing and let's say it's you know, training at whatever intensity zone you train in a certain frequency and it gets you really good results. So you keep doing it and that's intelligent up to a point, but you've got to be able to zoom out and see the big picture 
And if it's not getting you results on the big picture, then you've got a problem, right? That, that, you know, it could just be an overuse of that same stimulus, or it could be something else. And I mean, it's fun to speculate on mechanisms there, but the mechanism turns out to be, you know, not the critically important thing. And what you need is, you know, frankly, just more variety in the loading, more variety in terms of the things that that loading is is accomplishing or likely to accomplish physiologically, you know, doing, you know, low to moderate intensities at short rest intervals versus low to moderate intensities with high RPEs and longer rest intervals versus medium to high loading. There's all, lots of different things that you can do from a loading situation. And if you've basically got, you know, your I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but you know, you've got your playbook and you know, you've got your two or three plays that you just go back to every time. Well, I mean, that's great, but it's just very predictable. You know, that's not maybe not the best way to, to run your play selection. And I think it's probably not the best way to run your programming either. I think that's a cool analogy. If you think about that, if you run the same plays over and over again, soon your opposing team is going to learn that. And I wonder like, talk about like homeostasis is that our body figuring that out you know who, who knows right like we're just speculating this is the fun of sure. it that you and i have when, whenever yeah. we're chatting about this stuff as we speculate like what is the mechanism of action i mean dr mike t nelson says you know physiology is complex but decisions are not and i think that's a cool quote you know the decision to say ah, i'm going to do eight reps this cycle versus you know my traditional fours or triples that's a pretty easy decision to make you know, is it accomplishing something physiologically that we don't know about? Maybe, you know, but the decision itself is pretty easy to make. I do think it's logical though, to say, Hey, if I keep doing these things all the time, eventually, logically, it's just got to stop working. Right. Cause I've overused it. And it, to geek out for a second, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. And I know that you and I at powerlifting American nationals, we had this long discussion about diagnostic weeks. So maybe. Are you okay talking about that a little bit and yeah. your thoughts around diet? Okay. So one of the things you and I talked about is that in some of the project momentum work that you did from a number of years ago, there was this understanding that athletes who were really good at AMRAPs at 80% probably needed to train higher intensities because they've already trained this quality, right? Likely. And they're already good at it. And the athletes that are really bad at reps at 80% for an AMRAP probably need to train higher reps, likely because they haven't done it. And that got you thinking, well, when you work with athletes, maybe taking a diagnostic approach might open up a lens for what are some things that they might need to do in their programming. And maybe not initially, but it's in the back of your mind down the road when you've got a stretch of time to experiment. Yeah. So how did that thinking play out for you when you were thinking about your block after the meeting? Well, I did do some, I want to say I did some velocity testing and part of what I was trying to measure there was rep capacity. So reps at 70% and, you know, that being as true of a 70% as you can make it. So not like a fixed load that's about 70% because, you know, being a few percentage points off would matter in that at least. So Usually there's some sort of benchmarking set that gives you an idea of your current 1RM. And then you take 70% of that estimated 1RM and do an AMRAP with it. And, uh, you know, I think initially in that block, I did 10 on the bench, which is fairly low, right? And then the early block of capacitors is focused around building rep capacity. Now there's a lot of rep work. There's a lot of short rest interval work things of that nature, then at the end, I could get 12 reps with 70%. So it's worth noting that the 70% went up a little bit. So it was heavier in absolute weight, but still 70% of my current estimation. And I got two additional reps with it, which, you know, 10 to 12, 10 reps going to 12 reps is, it's a meaningful change, you know, es especially my performances, especially on bench, tend to be very consistent. So I, to me, especially, that seems like a meaningful change. And then I went into the late block of capacitor, which tends to be oriented more toward, I wrote a little bit about it 
in the article that we have in our article section, but then the full block is posted in the training lab. But that block tends to be characterized by more, it's higher intensity for sure. There's a reintroduction of singles, heavier weights, more rep drops, more complete rest intervals and things like that. And historically, my bench has responded really well to it. My bench responded crazy well to it then. You know, so for me, a good result on bench would be, you know, to add five pounds in a week at the same velocity. That would be good. And if I could do that for a few weeks, you know, three, four or five weeks, that's a good training block. I was adding 10 pounds a week and getting faster. So, you know, I mean, that was, you know, a very good response. And that just, I've got enough data at this point to say that's not a fluke. Like that doesn't just happen. You know, there's something that causes that to happen. And, you know, ended up with a bench at the end of that training block that was, I forget if it, it was near PR levels. I don't think it was quite at PR levels, but they were weights that I hadn't touched in a year or more. Bench, well, all the lifts really, but bench in particular is what we're talking about now. And that went really well. And it makes me wonder, like from a specialization perspective, just how specialized your bench became while squat was detrained a bit and you, you were still doing the front squat, but the competition squat was a little bit detrained. The competition deadlift wasn't trained pretty much at all for a number of years. So basically, if you think about like novelty and specialization, like the bench was the thing holding on the longest. And now you throw in this cycle that's totally bonkers in comparison to things that you were doing. It's totally different. There's reasons why it's not like you just like picked protocols out of the sky. Like you had logic behind them. You ran those. And then from that experiment, you were able to see that actually helped to move the needle a bit. And so maybe it's the novelty, maybe it's the protocols. It, at the end of the day, you noticed that doing something different resulted in that different outcome. And ultimately that's from a collaboration. That's the best thing we could hope for is that the two of us were able to put our heads together and come up with some ideas some mechanism of action, some potential journey for you to go on to see if it helps to move the needle. Now, the other thing that was really challenging is here we are writing all this stuff up and coming up with ideas, and then you ended up getting some hip issues along the way. So do you want to talk about that a little bit in terms of the hiccups for deadlift? Yeah, it kind of yeah, had a weird start. So when we were probably three months out or so, actually, it actually started with a hamstring that I was deadlifting and got a very minor tweak in my hamstring. It was one of those that you couldn't quite tell if it was injured or just sore. You know, I mean, it was barely perceptible. It took, you know, I had a, a week and a half off or something like that. That was just kind of part of normal training even. And then when I came back, it was a little bit tender, but not enough to even stop a training session, you know. But I think what happened is that it was tweaked enough that I was trying to protect it a little bit. And as a result of that was putting more strain on my back than I otherwise would have. And it was around that time that I strained my back. And this is really where our collaborative relationship really showed its worth was the working through of this issue. At first, it seemed like a minor back strain. You know, it was one of those where I was pretty much fine day to day and, you know, in a very short amount of time, didn't notice it day to day at all. And then I would come in to lift and it would be fine until it wasn't fine. You know, it was a kind of a sudden onset thing. In fact, if I remember correctly, we thought it was fine. And then I was working up in one of the lifts. I, I think it started out working up in the deadlift one day and Injured it, injured it again, shut it down, wait a few days, came back in and thought, well, I'll do front squats because front squats have historically not bothered my low back at all, you know, and, you know, I'm working up, everything feels fine, doing all the stuff that you're supposed to do, you know, this isn't my first day. So I'm working up slow, monitoring for pain and everything and any sort of indicator that things aren't right, everything seems fine until I get to something it wasn't even that heavy, but it felt it re-injure again, you know, and throughout each of these processes, you and I are in dialogue and said, well, adjust this plan, adjust that plan. And at, at this point, you know, this was 
now you're two months out and you've got an injury that seems to be healing, but slowly, you know, and that's a very different scenario <laughs> and one that, you know, it's not panic mode yet, but it, it's getting close. You know, you've got to be a, about your business at that point. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to jump in and say, I remember those conversations and I remember talking about bringing you back to what are the goals of this meet, right? And just talking that through a bit, like, what are you hoping to have happen your first meet back in six years at that point? It was six years, right? Yeah. So what would you like to have happen? And I remember several times you saying, I want to show up well for myself. I want to do a good job but I'd also really like to beat my previous numbers from the last meet that I did when I was hurt. And if I could just have that uh, as a kind of baseline level of performance, I'd be happy. And so one of the ways that I kept talking you through that was saying, well, this is what you did at the last meet based on this performance, you're beating that already. So let's not put any undue stress on having to take it further. Right. Who would have thought that Mike T would respond to numbers, you know? So, you know, just going back to that of, Hey, look, this is where you were at in 2016. Here's where you are now. And there's no reason why if you competed today that you couldn't beat your previous performance. And I think that helped to anchor like where you were in the reintroduction process and also break down any unnecessary expectations, slow down the panic mode a little bit. There was some conversation about you know, you wanting to deadlift every day that I'm glad I talked you out of that. But like that happens to all of us, right? Like when we're hurt, we want to, we're like peeking into a meet. Like I, I've had meets like that. Heck, the last meet that I did, I remember reaching out to you. I think it was like that Saturday, less than, it was six days out from the meet. I ended up hurting my back on an equipped deadlift that went sour. And I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. And you were like, hey, listen, you know what? The work is in, a lot can happen in a couple of days. Let's just see how it goes. You can pull out even until, you know, the even at weigh-ins, you could just say, hey, it ain't going to happen today. Or you could just go in and bench only if that's what you can do. And I sure. remember thinking about that going, ah, oh, I didn't think of that, you know? And I think that's the value of a collaborative relationship is being able to see the potential outcomes, right? Like mem remembering like why you're here, what are your goals? What's the hierarchy? What are the things that you want to achieve? What are the numbers showing you? And remember that, things can turn in a really positive direction a very short period of time, which they did, you know, yeah. at that meet for me and they did for you at this one as well. Yeah. For me, as we started to come back, like I mentioned that injury in particular was stubborn and slow to heal. And it took a few weeks for us to notice like how slowly, you know, and that's what precipitated a change in my deadlift technique. And, you know, honestly, it, persisted. It, initially, it was just going to be a thing that I did to start doing some kind of deadlifting, uh, but it turned out it was fairly strong and then at least comparable, possibly stronger than my other style and felt safer. So, I mean, that's a hard thing to say no to. It doesn't seem to be any obvious downside to it. So, well, the other thing with that technique too, was I remember while well, you're first exploring it again, it was out of necessity. Right. Like yeah. You're like, Hey, John, I found this technique that I think I could try using. I'm going to butcher Kokleoff. Did I say that right? No, you're pretty close. I think okay. Kokleoff is how I've always said it, but I don't okay. know, maybe I'm butchering it too. <laughs> so, you know, you wanted to try a little bit of a dynamic start that would put you in a more upright posture because you noticed that there was less pain there. And I thought that was a great problem solving opportunity to say, Hey, look, the static start, the way I've been doing it for this amount of time, it's just it's not sustainable, it's not stable. And if I do this dynamic start, I can get through that part of the range of motion that's painful and I can pull some good weight with it. And I remember us like analyzing, you had, I say us, you analyzing your joint angles and looking at these and upright posture, measuring things. And I'm like, hey, what if we just, what if you try taking your stance in a little bit like your normal deadlift, come in a little bit more narrow. And then like your bar velocity went through the roof the following week. And that was the cool thing about the collaborative relationship was it was just like pointing out those little factors, pointing out the little things, paying attention to that kind of stuff. And, you know, I want to echo that it's so cool when you have those opportunities with athletes where they pay attention to so many variables, when they have so much data, when they are paying attention to the recovery rhythms and all that kind of stuff that you have all of that information in front of you and you can analyze it and say, well, what about this thing? Because we were talking with Daniel DeBrock on our 
recent podcast and he brought up something that I thought was really useful. Like when you're working with someone that's highly competitive, it's usually not the sweeping changes that have to happen. It's usually yeah. a really tiny tweak, but that tiny tweak makes such a big difference for someone who's optimized their sleep, their nutrition, right? Their training. And for you, like a small tweak of, Hey, can you, what if we move your stance in like a centimeter, <laughs> you know, that made such a big difference for you. And that and really, that I think is what it's like when you're work, when you're working with someone who pays attention to all those things and is really advanced. Now, I mean, well, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, there's so much to say there, you know, regarding technical mastery, being this process that's never done or, you know, the do as I say, not as I do <laughs> sort of style here. I mean, it's funny because, and it's just perspective, right? Because as a coach, you know, if I had an athlete who showed up to me with a bunch of joint angle analyses and stuff like that, they had done, you know, uses, using coach's eye on a video shot from their phone or something, you know, I'm going to do the same thing. Well, this is a lot of work, but not a whole lot of useful data, you know, and we're going to end up doing something similar. We're going to, a lot of times what that stuff ends up doing is distracting you from the goal. And if you know, keep the goal in focus, then the simple answers are often good answers. And it's fine to look at more detail and occasionally there's something hidden there. But I know that I have a tendency to really dig into those details for myself, but I don't know that it's that much value added. I think it's, you know, trivial at best <laughs> most of the time. Well, a funny anecdote on that. You and I just had a conversation about that. We were talking about like bar velocity and like all the <laughs> gazillion data points with bar velocity that you could look at. Last repetition velocity, first repetition sure. velocity, average velocity, peak, like the list goes on. And I remember telling you like the things that I've been tracking recently, which is all of those things. And you actually coming back and saying, why don't we take a simpler approach? And I, I think that that's, again really useful because the second set of eyes helps to see through times when you can get focused on the weeds and you're not paying attention to the direction in which you're heading and the simple decisions like just move a little bit to the right, you know, or in your yeah. case with the deadlift, what if you bring your stance in just a little bit? Does the bar speed go faster? We could do it as an exercise next week and see. And if it does and your force output feels the same, cool. What if we run with that for a little while, you know, and Often those are the simple decisions, which are the right ones, you know? And if you've got to get that far into the weeds to notice a difference, you know, I'll see this occasionally from a coaching standpoint with people who are trying to decide between sumo and conventional, and they're both very comparable, right? They're running similar loads, similar RPEs, similar bar speeds, you know, and you really, they're really starting to split hairs and try to figure out which one they're better suited for. I mean, at that point, you don't know and your margin for error starts to go up and it really isn't that consequential of a decision anyway. So you either continue to do both until a decision is clear, you know, or you know, you just pick one. Now you pick the one that's most comfortable, least painful, most sustainable, things like that. And if there's not a clear winner there, then I mean, I guess you're just going to do both. And that's not a bad thing either. I, honestly, I think people that can do both at a pretty decent level. I should also say, I don't really know anybody that's super high level that can deadlift at a high level with both styles. So you probably do need to settle on one eventually. But if you're not there yet, then I don't think you should force it. You know, if you get to the point where you've really got to split hairs, then the difference is probably trivial anyway. So it's just not, you know, I don't know if you remember like in science class when you guys, if you guys ever talked about significant figures, but there was always something that didn't make a lot of sense to me then, you know, but like later on it, I started to understand more like what that was all about. And it's basically that, you know, it's this kind of splitting hairs type of thing. You know, it's not exactly this, but it works as an analogy. If you uh, maybe works as an analogy for five people, but I'm going <laughs> to go with it. You know, if you're, if we're splitting hairs to figure out like, what are you better suited for sumo or conventional? We've got to dig into, well, 
the peak velocity on this one was that, and the you know the minimum velocity on this other one was that. Well, okay, maybe it's just not that big of a difference to worry about. Maybe for you know as close as we can tell with any sort of reliability, they're the same. Right, and this is one of the things that you have always said, and I say it probably multiple times a week to the athletes I coach of let's keep the goal, the goal, right? So if the goal is how do we gain at the fastest rate possible, that is sustainable by sustainable. I mean that we're not really flirting the line with pain and, you know, recovery and things of that nature, pay attention to the rate of gain, pay attention to the E1 RM and your experience under the bar. And that decision will get pretty clear. Honestly, when you look at it from that lens, hey, when I do, this is how fast my sumo gains, and this is where my peaky one RM is. When I do conventional, this is where I'm at. Okay. Usually one's going to beat the other. And if it doesn't, and they're really that close, all right, which one do you think you could train more consistently with less pain and more comfort and better technique? And usually the decision is pretty clear there. And that's kind of what happened here with the deadlift for you was like, as you were exploring, you found a place that you could just be consistent with. You know, and yes. if nothing else, consistency with low enough pain and an ability to add load strategically leading up to the meet was what did it, you know? Now, what I thought was interesting was your comments afterward, after the meet of how much fun you had at the meet. So from a mindset perspective, like there was some stuff going on there where you approach the meet in a certain way that made you enjoy this meet totally differently than in your highest level of, you know, competition years, you know? So if we look at probably 2000, would you say 2008 to 2013 around there was probably the highest levels of competition you were at. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there was something about this meet that really stood out. And if you, anybody ever wants to see Mike's history on competition, go to open powerlifting or open IPF and go take a look at Mike's competition history. Man's done a lot of meets. <laughs> so what made this meet stand out that was different? So I've talked before, we've talked a little bit about how I went into the squat and the deadlift in particular with kind of a, not a lot of concrete expectation and they both performed well. And it doesn't appear that the lack of, you know, very specific top end goals for those events, it doesn't appear to to have hurt me at all. You know, I've also coached a handful of lifters who for various reasons went to competitions in similar ways. Often it's because they're just getting over an injury, you know, and we don't have enough training to really know how things are going to go. So they go anyway and they play it by ear and sometimes it works out great. And, but then even when it doesn't, they're still not that upset about it. And it doesn't appear, once again, it doesn't appear that just having a goal written down confers any sort of performance benefit. That's not obvious to me at all. And so if having the goal written down is not helpful in terms of performance, and it's potentially detrimental in terms of experience, then should we do that? And I don't know, like I legitimately don't know the answer. I've been talking to some sports psych types about this because I am hesitant to start advising my athletes to, hey, stop setting goals, <laughs> stuff like that. And that's not exactly what I mean anyway. But the management of expectations is important and we want them to have a positive experience. At the same time, they do have things that they want to accomplish and we need to not look past those things. You know, but I think often we settle on these goals like specific numbers and things like that that we're trying to achieve. And, you know, we think that we're going to accomplish that just because we're trying hard enough, you know, just like this sheer force of will, you know, you know, heroes in movies and things of that nature are, they often accomplish the goal through sheer force of will. Right. And I think we read ourselves into those narratives a little bit, but I don't think it works that way <laughs> in real life. And, I don't know. I don't have anything conclusive to say about it that at this point, but it is something that I'm like actively wondering about and wondering if we ought to be advising people in a little different way. And I suppose that's 
That's why like leading into the competition, I kept coming back to the, what is your why? Like, why are you doing this? Why start competing again now? Right. Like, yeah. What is it about this meet? What is it about, you know, doing it at this specific time that is impactful and important to you? And I think reflecting on that helps to anchor the current decisions in the bigger plan. Right. So if this was a event where you could be setting records or if you were competing for your national team, you might approach it differently because of these external rewards that are, or these external things that are placed upon you and your goals may change. And then maybe you might not have made the same decisions or have been yeah. open to a more modest approach on the way, right? Versus here, there was really nothing on the line. And that was one of the things I kept saying is you have nothing left to prove the sport. Like you've already done so much for this sport, Mike, like where you've brought over auto regulation into our field in a concrete way. Like you've created emerging strategies. You've done all these things. You've competed at the world games and won. There is no, there's really nothing else that you need to do to quote unquote, prove yourself. So this meet is for sure enjoyment, fun, and an opportunity to dust the cobwebs off and show that you still love competing. And what's neat about that is it allowed you to be conservative with loading. It allowed you to take your time with things and think of solutions that if you were under the gun and you knew that you were in an opportunity to, for a podium finish at Worlds, you might make a different decision about. Well, and it's worth pointing out that probably would have been the wrong thing to do. Right. You know, that we at first tried slightly more aggressive postures, you know, and specifically with regard to the return from the deadlift injury and had a couple setbacks. And then we decided to get more conservative with it. And you're right. It was definitely an uneasy decision to make. It was something that wasn't, we had to be forced into it through a couple re-injuries, you know? So it's definitely not our first choice, but we were able to make that decision and then pull it together. But you, I think you're right that if things would have been different, you know, if there's more external pressure to perform, you know, do you make some other decision in that situation that's, you know, trying to be as aggressive as you can be, you know, you're trying to walk this line and you just walk it too closely because we're probably one more re-injury away from not having a good time in the deadlift, you know, like it came together just about on time. You know, it came together on time enough that I got a few solid training sessions in. I was able to keep things together. I was able to still train the muscles so that, you know, there was good like, strength underpinnings available. So that went well, but you know, if we had another two weeks of setback, then I probably would have gone much worse, you know, still well enough that it would have, you know, accomplished the stated goal, but not nearly as well as it did go, you know? So yeah, that's a fairly tight timeline, you know? And you think if you were in a situation with more external pressure, you potentially could have made a decision, you know, which is like a couple degrees to the left or to the right. And it's got significant impacts on the overall outcome. I start to think, man, what is there to be gained then from that external pressure? You know, and it's an honest question too. And I'm not suggesting that there's nothing to be gained from it because everyone has had the experience where merely signing up for a competition serves to focus your training and increase your motivation. Like even people who are very bought in, you know, see their identity as part of this, you know, like that's not, they don't need help with motivation really but signing up for a competition the external pressure around it does serve a focusing purpose to a point but it's so easy to take that too far you know and there I, there's not a good heuristic currently that would tell you when you're doing that or not and I, I mean i guess that's the role of the coach is to offer that outside perspective and hopefully have a bit more experience I was just having a conversation with another lifter about the same thing. And he, you know, he was contemplating an international meet and his point was like, his squat isn't where he wanted or needed it to be. 
And so zooming out, I was able to say, you know, Hey, look at the last two exposures. We're going up. Things are getting better. And there's no reason why that trend line shouldn't continue based on the ideas that we've put together, the plan that we've laid out. And if you do this meet, and let's say your squat isn't at the absolute highest possible, does it still make it worthwhile to do because you have an opportunity to do this on the bench or to do this on the deadlift or to have this experience, right? And asking those questions and at the end of the conversation, you know, he was like, yeah, let's do it 100% because there's a lot to be gained. At the end of the day, I've only got, you know, two or three more lifts or two, two or three more meets as a junior. That's it. And after that, then I'm in the open. So let me take advantage of this opportunity, even if I'm not my absolute all, all high, you know, on squat. And I think that it's just reframing, right? It's just reframing the experience and looking at the situation in a different way. You know, if you had just beat your previous bests from 2016 by a small margin, you might've walked away from that meet feeling satisfied. What made you ecstatic about this meet is that you didn't have all these pressures and you were totally blown away by your performance on squat and deadlift for that day, you know? And I think the challenge now, which brings me into a question I want to ask you is, as you think about competing again, because I know that you signed up for a meet, right? Yeah, I got, you got one coming up in November, right? I start thinking about continuing competing. Is there lessons from this meet that you're going to take with you in preparation for that meet and beyond? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, there's definitely like the tactical lessons of like how I want to conduct training. And we touched on some of those already, but like from a mentality standpoint, I've been trying to resist, I guess, the external stimuli a bit, you know, I'm trying not to think too much about what's so-and-so doing, who's, you know, my going to be my competition at that meet, or uh, like, I want to really narrow the focus in on my own performance and really, yeah, I guess that's the main thing. I want to lift my lifts. And I guess the idea that's worth exploring here is what happens if you do that to more than usual, you know? So like, I don't want to make it sound like if I'm in a competition and I need to pick some number for my third attempt deadlift and pull for the win. Yeah, of course I'll do that. You know? So it's not that I'm going to ignore the situation around me and not compete, you know, but I also want to make absolutely sure that I'm not doing dumb things because of some of these external pressures, because of the situation we just talked about with the deadlifts. If it had been, you know, a couple degrees to the right or left in some of those decisions that we made, then that whole competition could have gone a lot differently. And I don't see how external pressure would make any of that better. You know, I mean, I've said this before that I think I, like people talk about social media and, you know, coaches will use the lifts that lifters post on social media to form scouting reports and stuff like that. I don't think that's such a big deal. I don't think it's worth hiding your lifts. So, you know, you're affecting their scouting reports. I just don't think that's that much of a competitive advantage. I think it's probably more of a competitive advantage to post your stuff that post the lifts of you crushing stuff and your competition potentially sees that and then starts making dumb decisions in their training. Cause again, a couple degrees to the right or left, and that could go, that could cause things to go much worse for them. You know, a lot of times the good decisions that need to be made is threading the needle a little bit, you know? So that's yeah, a good I mean, point because it could go either way, right? If you right. hold off on posting the highlight reel, people have no idea what you're capable of. Like we saw Taylor Atwood a little bit with that, right? Where that holds off, doesn't show that the top sure. singles and nobody knows where his top end is at, including we were talking to Jason one time and he said he had no idea too, right? So, yeah. you know, you don't know where his top end is at. Or it could go in the other direction where people are seeing you crush your training. So they, you put the, your, your competition pushes really hard and makes decisions that they otherwise wouldn't have done. And so, yeah, it, yeah it, there really isn't a right or wrong here. Cause there, listen, there are people that watching their competitors crush it drives them. That gets them to, like you said, focus. All right. I got to get to sleep at this time. I've got to eat these things. I've got to be dialed in because I've got this competition coming up and that becomes a focusing agent. I liken it to, 
like test taking anxiety, right? You've heard about this, right? Like you need a certain base level of anxiety to perform, right? But at a certain level, anything beyond that is a diminishing marginal benefit to a point where you actually could probably be, it could be detrimental to your performance. Yeah. And like, you could see that even with psyching up for your squat, like with you, you don't need any external pressure to psych up for your squat. You need to cool right. off, right? Like you're cooling yourself down. Whereas me, I turned to a buddy of mine in 2019 nationals and said, Hey, can you do me a favor? I need you to slap me once or twice just to get me out of my <laughs> head a little bit. You know, I'm being dramatic here, but like the idea is that people need different things to perform their best. And I think there's lessons to be learned in, you know, the conservative approach that you took and not being in a rush to add kilos to the bar and just letting it be what it is and let the natural progression happen as it always has for you. And I think that's where a lot of competitors get in trouble is they assume that they need to make the trend line go faster than it ought to. That's, and I guess if I was going to bet from a competitive lifter standpoint, that would be my bet is that maybe, you know, Taylor posting his best lifts provides fuel for his competition and, you know, makes them more motivated. But I bet on a long enough timeline, you start to force errors with that kind of pressure. You know, you start to, yeah, they're pushing a little bit harder and that makes things go well this block and next block. But now you've got several blocks where you're running hotter than you really ought to, you know, or are you like, where's the balancing to that? Because you're going to have to let things cool off and you can't let things cool off because Taylor's applying the pressure. You know, well, we heard and, when we had Ben on our podcast, the whole, mm -hmm. we've got a push right. mentality, right? Remember he was talking about that. And I mean, I get that some people will need that, right? But I don't think those tend to be high level competitors. I think high level competitors have a tendency to push anyway. They're, you know, I talk about the people like you want to be the kind of lifter where, you know, if left to your own devices, you're going to add a little bit of weight to the bar, you know, like you've. You just want that additional load. I think your high level competitors tend to be that type of person. They don't need a whole lot of encouragement to add even more weight to the bar. And, you know, it can be too much, you know, I mean, I've made that error before too. So it, this is probably biased coming from me because this is definitely a mistake that I've made. So I, I suspect that other people are prone to it as well, but yeah, it would be interesting to to see how that worked. So I suppose like a good last question for you with this meet coming up in November is, you know, have you thought about what your goals are? Are you going to state any goals? Or are you just going to take what's there that day? You probably will just take what's there that day. But are you approaching it that way? Or are you saying, okay, this is my last performance. I'd like to be here. I'd like this to happen. I definitely have some numbers that I want to do, but I'm still in this process of trying to figure out if it's best to go after them directly or if it's best to just lift my lifts and see what's there, you know? And I, at this point, I'm too far out to, for it to matter a great deal, you know? But one thing I try to do with my, is we don't build the meat card. We don't do attempt selection until after our last heavy sessions, you know, usually even like the last opener session, you know, we've got a pretty good idea where their openers are going to be, but we won't actually build the meat card until, you know, usually that's three, four days out. You don't, first of all, look, it's not that difficult to build them. It, they go pretty quick. You don't need days and days to, to ruminate on the finer points of it. And that's probably another thing that's detrimental, but I don't want them to get fixated on certain numbers. And then, you know, the taper isn't going quite as well as we would have wanted. So we dial things down two and a half kilos. And now they feel like, oh no, I'm not doing that great. You know, I mean, it sounds silly, but small things become big things when you're stressed out like that. So found that it's beneficial to just wait and tell the athlete that we're waiting and we're waiting so that we don't form a lot of these super specific expectations before we have a right to form them, you know? So I'm probably going to take a similar tax with myself. I mean, I've got some numbers that I'm aiming at, but I also want to be realistic about it. And I need to make sure that I'm not letting those numbers dictate the decisions that I'm making. 
Well, I think that's a great way to approach it is like, here's the direction I want to head. I'm going to head in that direction, but also I'm going to be realistic that I'm, there might be some twists and turns that I have to take and I'll take them as they happen and, you know, reevaluate as you get closer. And I think that's, I'm very interested to see how this competition goes for you approaching it that way. And also just coming off of a recent win, because that's the other thing, right? Yeah. From a performance standpoint, it's so much easier to keep performing well when the previous performances were going well, right? Like it becomes sort of this domino thing, right? Success stacks on success, right? So you just had this meet, it went well, you have some ideas, they're going well. There's no reason why this one couldn't go well. So if we keep building momentum, you know, we should have a great meet. And it's so much harder when it's in the other direction of, oh, I just hurt my back and now I have no idea how this is going to go. And the next session didn't go so great. And the session after that didn't go so great. It's so much harder to change that inertia and make it head in the other direction. So yeah. I am excited to see how this meet goes for you. Yeah. Well, same here. Well, John, thanks, man. I appreciate the conversation. I'm glad to touch base on some different styles of coaching and different, different ways of conducting a coach athlete relationship. And thanks for helping me work through some of the ideas around this as well. It's my pleasure, Mike. Anytime. All right. Thanks everyone for watching and listening and we'll see you next time.